What's going on, youth group? My name is Xavier. I'm with the uh, preaching team for Kings Harbor. I'm also a high school leader for the boys, uh, and I'm really excited to be here. It's always a blessing to be able to talk through the gospel and how we as young adults and as teens um, live in this new world and function and how the still the gospel still applies to it even to this day. So I'm really excited, really happy to be here. Um, so the kind of the first thing I want to do is throw a little PSA out, public service announcement. Um, I'm going to be talking about anxiety today. Um, and I know that for a lot of people, you hear that and you just kind of think general like nervousness or worry about your grades, your school, you know, who's your friend, if that boy or girl likes you or not. But for some people, it kind of carries a little bit more weight. Um, and there are those of us and people who struggle with the concept of anxiety in a different way that they feel it heavier. And so I kind of wanted to take a second and really walk through that in the sense of uh, this, this concept of clinical anxiety versus general anxiety. Um, and so general anxiety is just kind of the worry that you feel going through the issues of life and that you will come across and that it can weigh you down. Um, but this clinical anxiety is almost like a, a heavier, weightier thing where it just kind of makes you where you can't, you can't function, you can't really breathe, you, you experience different things that are a lot heavier. And because of that, I wanted to really make this point of separating this two that what I'm gonna talk about does apply to both. But if you are doing these things and you're still saying, Xavier, I still feel it. And I feel like it's like a darkness surrounding me, like people describe it in different ways, that it's okay to talk to somebody, uh, reach out to a trusted adult uh, whether it be your youth group leader, it could be a pastor, uh, a therapist, if you can get that resource, or even if you need it, medication. And all those things are okay. They're all tools of the Lord. They're all things that he has given us to help um, help us with this thing called anxiety. Um, and that it's not scary, you know, to talk to somebody about it. It doesn't make you, you know, crazy or weird or anything else like that. It's just something that can help you kind of lower it down to where it's more manageable by you. But ultimately, even in that, we're still trusting God. So I don't want you to think that you can just zone out, like, oh, okay, I kind of have clinical anxiety. I've been diagnosed with it, so I'm just going to, you know, it, you know, tap out. So like, no, still listen to what I'm going to say, but take that into account as well. And if you are feeling that heaviness, like I said, please talk to somebody. Uh, there are plenty of resources that we have at King's that we have around our area and people who want to listen to you who can empathize with that and who have been there before who want to help you. So I just kind of wanted to get that out of the way. Um, and then I want to start with a story. So whenever I was in high school, a long, long time ago in 2012, it was my senior year. And uh, for the most part of my entire high school, really my schooling in general, I was kind of the smartest kid in the class. Um, and I know you're kind of like, where is this going with anxiety? So I was valedictorian. Um, and so it was, the win it was around winter of my senior year. And I remember I was in college class and I made a, I was making a B so far. And my parents just were like not happy about it. They meant well, but just, you know, oh, like why you can do better than this. Like you're gonna let someone overtake you and they're gonna get the valedictorian uh, place that you should be in because you're smarter than that. Just kind of, you guys have probably been there before. Your parents are just saying, you know, you can do better, why aren't you doing better? And for whatever reason this time, I just couldn't handle it. And I kind of had a breakdown and I started crying and tearing up and I was really upset. And I was just telling them, I was like, listen, I'm doing the best I can. There's no one who's close to me um, in terms of in competition with me to get my valedictorian chip. And in fact, my guidance counselor went as far as to say, like, Xavier, you just have to stop trying. Like, you had to stop going to school for the next semester for you to lose it. And I told them that, and they were like, oh, we didn't, oh, so you're good, but I was still feeling this weight of, like, why isn't what I'm doing good enough? And all I want you guys to do is be proud of me. That's why I work as hard. And what I was feeling wasn't the weight behind the grades. It wasn't behind me getting to be in the class. It was behind this sense that my parents didn't feel proud of me, or I felt that they didn't feel proud of me. Um, and I'm sure that there are those of you who are in that same situation. If it's not with school, it's with your friends, it's with your significant other, it's with somebody around you that you feel this weight of like, I want to be accepted, I want to be secure. And we deal with that a lot. Um, and in that, we kind of put our trust and our, that hope for security into different things. We can put it into how well 
we achieve in life, what college we go to, you know, what position we graduate in, what job do we get, what, who are the people we hang around, all these different things that we try to find that security and that hope and that belonging to that ultimately just don't live up to it. So in that, I wanted to just kind of frame that when we're talking about anxiety, that ultimately my main idea and the main takeaway is if you're putting your hope and your want for security and for acceptance and for value, ultimately, and any of these other things that just falls short. So with that, let's jump into the text. So uh, I'm going to be coming from Luke 12, starting at verse 22, going through 34. Uh, so Luke verse 22, this is what it says. And he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about life, what you will eat, nor about your body and what you will put on. So instantly I'm gonna stop and back up because hold on a second, I see this word uh, therefore, and there's an old preaching cliche that every time you see a therefore, you got to find out what it's there for. This is where you'd be laughing. Actually, probably not. Even if you were here, you wouldn't be laughing. Um, so what that tells us is that there's something that precedes what Jesus is about to say that we needed to dig in and that we need to see and that we need to kind of pay attention because it adds context to what he's about to say in his instructions. So if we reverse it out and start in verse 13, we hear the story of these two brothers who come to Jesus and said, Jesus, can you be our arbiter. We're, we're arguing over something. We need you to kind of be the, the, the mediator over their inheritance. And Jesus kind of asked this question of, well, who, who made me judge over you? <laughs> like, why do, why do you want me to do it? And ultimately, the, what these brothers are fighting over is the share of what they're, they're going to get whenever their parents pass on. And Jesus tells a story about this man who has built, had these great fields of grain and of fruit and of all these different kind of things. And he has these storehouses and they're all full. And so he thinks to himself, the man does, and says, well, I have all this stuff and I'm out of room. What do I do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just big, build bigger storehouses. I'll build bigger farms and bigger grains. And his whole thing was like, I have all this stuff. I need to get more of it. So I'm gonna build bigger things for me and that I'm gonna be safe. That way I can just like cruise through the rest of my life and don't have to worry about a thing. And that very night, God had said, your soul is required of you. And what you have stored up for yourself, it'll be given to other people. And so you hear that, and the first thing I think of as an adult was like, well, what's the problem? Like, you know, it's not, you know, are you against this guy because he has a retirement plan? And that's where I was always been. I was like, well, like, it's not the worst thing in the world to save up for the future, right? Isn't it, God? But what the problem was is that he is finding his security. He wants to be safe in the possessions that he has instead of being open-handed with them. Because he had enough. He could have given it away to people. He could have done a lot more good in the community, but he decided, no, like, this is just for me. And that he held everything for his own satisfaction and security. And he... Really, when he got down, he treasured his treasure. And there, and that's where the fault lies. Like the expression in, in the scripture says, the love of money, the love of these things is the root of all evil. It's not wrong that he had it. It was wrong that he had it and treasured it so much and was like so inward about it. So he kind of leaves this open space and this tension of like, okay, God, well, how are we supposed to live if we don't, you know, we're not supposed to, if this, what this guy was doing was wrong, then how are we supposed to live? And there's just this reality that our faith can get lost in our possessions that we can get so comfortable with the things that we have, with the people with the, who we surround ourselves with. And ultimately, if we put keep our faith in that and not in God, the giver of those different things, then we start to really put that stuff in the position of God. And we really make them idols. This life is ultimately hollow and insecure. And insecure. Uh, worry is akin to idolatry in the sense that Whatever that thing is in your heart that you can't let go of, that you think is ultimately going to keep you safe and keep you happy and keep you valued, and is not going to satisfy you. And let me just put it out there. If that is your friends, if that is the amount of money that you or your parents have, if it is the shoes you wear, if it's the clothes you rock, if it, it you know, let's go ahead and step into it. If it's the person that you or your parents saw as a presidential candidate or elected official, that you're putting your hope and security in, or it's a system of government, those things will fail you because they're not meant to satisfy that. They're not meant to occupy that space. And that's the trouble with idolatry. It's not that we're not giving God his due praise, it's that we're trying to put something in that position where it doesn't belong. And ultimately it falls through. 
and it doesn't work. God is meant to satisfy that role. So now Jesus is about to roll out like, okay, then this is how you should live. You don't live like that. We don't live like someone who puts their hope and all that they, their stock, as we would say, in things and items and people. We put it in Christ. So let's move on. And start and read from verse 23. Uh, For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither reap, sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn. Yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do something as small as this, why are you anxious about the rest? So I really want to pause there because there's this kind of breakout between what we're going to go into and this, this internal aspect of the soul and of your body and of the needs that are met by it, like food that he calls it. And then what he gets to later, where it's talking about clothing, it's about the external. So some things to kind of just keep that in mind as we're moving forward. So here we're going to talk about the internal struggles that Jesus is saying, like, don't worry about what you're going to eat um, and where you're going to get food from and all these different things. And that can be easy to say for somebody who's always had something to eat, who's always never went without being hungry for too long. But the reality is there's some of us, I remember I growing up, I'm growing up in scenarios where I was like, I'm hungry and there's not really much in the pan. There's not really much in the pantry. There's no food there. And I don't know where my next meal's coming from because payday is this far away and we're just out of money. And so how are we worrying about that and why and what do we do with that? And there's a reality that there are kids across the country and the kids across the world who are starving. There are people who are starving and there are people who say they love God and yet they're dealing with these internal things about like, how am I going to be provided for for my day-to-day substance, for money, for, like I said, shelter, for food? And the reality is that God sees that. And God will ensure that all your needs are met. And the thing about it is, worrying doesn't help it. That's what Christ is saying um, in verse 25, where it's like, what good does worrying do? If you can't add a single hour to your life, if you cannot change the course of your life and your your future by worrying about so much of as an hour, then why worry about the rest of it? Then why worry about these things? And that God sees ravens, he sees little birds and mice and all these other different creatures. And he makes sure that they're taken care of and they don't work for it. They don't have to like, you know, punch in a time card. You'll get that later when you get you get a job or anything like that. And God supplies them with what they need. And that's been the reality of my life. I can, I didn't grow up rich. Uh, I didn't grow up with a ton of money uh, growing up. You know, both my parents worked and, you know, we, we made do with what we could. But there was never a point where God didn't provide a need for us. Like, did I go hungry sometimes? Yeah, but it wasn't like I'm, you know, deathly on the you know, brink of dying because I didn't eat. It was just kind of, might have waited a few hours, might have been, you know, maybe a little bit more than that before I ate. But God has always supplied that. Worrying is a self-starting and perpetual torture. Jesus points to the birds and how God will care for, care for them. And ultimately, if you're worried about food or time itself, it's out of our control. We can't control time. We can't bend it to our will. We can't do any of these things. So why worry about it? And you're just kind of saying, well, Xavier, that's just kind of cliche. But seriously, think about it. If you can't change it, if you can't alter it, then, then why worry and put yourself, because really what you're doing then is if you think that, oh, I, I need to change, like I'm a, I don't want to live till, you know, I want to live to this age and I want to do this and that. You're putting yourself in that God position. You're putting yourself in that position of, of, of a provider that you don't need to occupy. And you're not meant to. Your shoulders just aren't that wide enough to bear that load. And that God is good enough to handle it. He's saying God cares about birds. And how much more are birds than you to him? So in that, when it comes to these like day-to-day things, we don't worry about like just the course of your life in general. Like there's a lot of people who are worried about how they'll live, how they'll die. And ultimately, like I said, it's not in your control. And it's okay to have a plan. And I'm not saying just, you know, look at the future and say whatever happens, happens. But you have to submit that to the will of God and let that go and trust that God has a plan for it that is good. 
So then Jesus moves on from the, from the internal, from the concept of food and life itself to how we are perceived um, and how people look at us and how we want to present ourselves to others. And so in <clears throat> verse 27, he goes on to say, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like any one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? And so when I was really kind of struggling, I'm like, okay, what do clothes represent in, in, in his time? Um, when Christ was saying this, what is remaining in our time? And it kind of what, what the Lord revealed to me is that it's always this concept of status. It's always this concept of how you present yourself to other people. You know, in that day, the different kinds of fabrics you wore, and if you could wear linens or silks, it, it was a show of status and of wealth and of like, hey, this is how important I am that I can afford these things. And that's not too dissimilar to today's time. But ultimately, like the way we present ourselves to others is what we wear. You know, if I'm like, oh, I got a Ralph Lauren shirt on, I can, you know, I can afford a little bit of things. Or if I have Supreme or Prada or whatever the new brands are, um, I say new brands, the brands that still exist. <clears throat> that if I present myself in such a way that people will perceive me and that I can control how people perceive me and how I want to be presented to people. And, and God still comes back to this concept of don't worry about it. Don't worry about how you're perceived by people because at the end of the day, they ain't got a heaven or hell to put you in. And ultimately, their valuation of you is never going to be completely accurate because they don't know you the way God knows you. <clears throat> and no matter how you try to present yourself, there's reality that some sometimes people can see through, right? Like I always see people who like try to present themselves as this kind of big, strong, like I'm tough, like I, you know, I got it. I don't have to worry about this thing. But inside, if we're being honest, there's some issues there that we don't really want people to see. We don't want people to know about, and then we cover them up. But to be clothed in like righteousness and be clothed in the beauty of holiness and what God has for us and, and following and being faithful to the will of God, that is something that no one can ever take away from you. You can't pull that off. You can't, no one can undress that from you. And ultimately, I kind of think about it like this. We all have that one outfit that is the outfit where it's like, man, if, when I wear this, like I know I look good. Like all the guys are like, hey man, like you look dope. All the girls are like, oh, you look cool. And we, there's a confidence boost in that. And that, wow, like I feel good because people are validating me. And that's good. I'm, I'm not necessarily taking away from that and saying that's a bad thing. But what I am saying is that can fade once we take that off. Then that's something we feel like we normally feel. But to be wrapped in the glory that God puts on us when we are one of his, um, as Jesus would put it, like these, li these lilies are clothed with the beauty of not even Solomon, the richest, wisest, you know, most elegant man who probably ever lived could even have. Because it's something that's God given and not something that you can put on. And that the validation that we should seek comes from God and that God sees worth in you and that doesn't matter how intelligent you may think of yourself, how cool or uncool you think yourself, how smart or beautiful or any of these other things. Like God sees worth in you as you are. And, and the same God who, who made this glorious sunset or the islands or these pictures that we see on Instagram or on Facebook or on TikTok and like, man, if I can just live there, that view is so awesome. The same God who created those views and those sceneries and backgrounds created you and created me and he looked on it and said that is my masterpiece that is the pinnacle of my creation you me you know everyone that you know like that's the pinnacle of god's creation and you were so valuable to him that he was worth that it was worth dying for that's why he sent christ there to die for us because he loves us that much and if we shift our focus from the way people perceive us to the way God perceives us and live in such a way that honors that and shows that, it just fills you with this wonder. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not saying don't care what people think because I don't care what you think about me and have this like really bad attitude towards it, but understand that my value comes from the fact that my father loves me and that Christ 
died for me, and now I'm one of his own. And that's and that is nothing, something no one can take away, no matter what they say about you, no matter how they laugh about you because you're the weird Christian kid, no matter how they make fun of you because you can't do this and that. The reality is you're his, and that's all you need, the validation of the father. And I get from some people, you might hear father and think, well, my dad's not really all that great, so I don't know if I want to see God in this way. Um, and I don't know if I want to necessarily have that, val I don't know what that's like. Well, I can tell you right now that that is a validation and that is a feeling that is wonderful and that we can walk in that with gladness because that is our true father. He was the better father. If you have a good father, he's a better father. If you have a bad father, he's a better father. <laughs> he's the best father. Um, and really, when in verse, 20, uh, verse 28, he hits the nail on the hand. It's a matter of faith. The reason why we worry and we have anxiety is ultimately because we're not putting trust in God enough with that thing. If I'm worried about what my wife is gonna be or who's gonna be or when I get married or who I'll get married to or where I'll, you know, eventually where I'll get a job, where I'm gonna to go to college, where I'm gonna do, and if I worry and take that on too much, it's because I'm not trusting God's plan. God's got it. All we have to do is trust in that. And if, if it doesn't go the way you necessarily want it to go, that's okay because it's still the better plan. Like no matter what your plan for your future is, God's plan for it is ultimately better. And I say that as someone who's lived through it. I say as someone who didn't go to the college he wanted to go to, who didn't come work in the place he wanted to work to. But ultimately through the by and by and when I get through that, as I go through that, I trust that God's plan is still better. And if I hadn't been here, I wouldn't have grown. I wouldn't have met friends and all this other different things that are awesome and wonderful. So it just comes down to trust. And that's the same question that Ezekiel or Elijah posted to the Israelites. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust Baal? That Joshua pro like probed to Israel. Are you going to trust God and follow God? Are you going to trust these other foreign gods and follow them? But you got to choose one. And ultimately, it's the question that the serpent posed to Adam and Eve. Are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust your eyes and what looks good? We're gonna trust the word of God. So this thing comes down to just trust. And we gotta put our trust in Christ. So let's move on to verse 29. And do not seek what you what you are to eat and what you are to drink, and nor be worried, for the nations all of the world seek after these things, and your father knows that you need him. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And so here's this this concept that's really like kind of eye-opening for the disciples. We come across this, this notion of God, of Jesus calling God a father. And all the way up until this point, we're not used to calling God father. They weren't used to calling God father. They knew God as this cosmic being who, who ruled over Israel and who ruled over the world and who led them. So they'll say, well, children of Abraham, we're children of the promise, we're children of, children of Israel. But now we're starting to see the language of, like, this is your father. And to look at God from a perspective of, Hey, he's not just the one who keeps the universe in order. He's not the one that leads your particular country or the other countries around it in your individual life. He's there. He wants to lead you. He wants to have this personal, intimate relationship with you. And that changes everything because God becomes this, switches from this almighty, you know, quote genie, phenomenal cosmic power entity to someone who loves you and cares for you individually, who wants to see your needs and wants to love you. Uh, and Jesus puts it again. Seek first the kingdom and these things will be added to you. If you're pursuing God, all those different things, where you worry about your food, where you worry about how you look, ultimately they'll be provided for you. And we don't worry like the way the world worries. I, we, sit and, we sat and watched through all these different, you know, this year of COVID and of Australia burning and of World War III, and we saw the whole world like just worry about every single thing. And we're worried about the next year. We're worried about the next month, what's gonna come, like who's gonna die this time, who's gonna do this, like how, how many people are gonna die from COVID, all this worrying. And I'm not saying that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we have a hope that's different. And so we don't worry like they worry because ultimately we trust in the Father whose plan is to take care of us. And so how do we live then? What's the actual application? How do we go about living now that we know all this stuff? And I'm gonna read through 
uh, verse 32 through 33. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in heaven that does not fall, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. The application is you live open-handedly. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that everything that we are given, everything that God grants us and that we might be given through uh, you know, our parents or anyone else, we live with it open-handedly. That if God needed to take that and say, hey, I need you to give this to somebody else. I need you to do this particular thing with this. I need you to give it up entirely. That we can do it because he said, you know what, God, it's not worth you. So anything that I have is not worth knowing you and following you. So I live open-handedly with it. So my relationships, who I'm dating, I give it open. I live open-handedly. That if that's not the person that you have for me, that I'm okay to let it go. And it might hurt. It might be painful, but I'll let it go because I know that you got something better going for me. There's an old expression my pastor used to say is like, God doesn't want to take anything away from you. He wants to get something to you. And so the reality is, in all those different things, live open handedly. Whatever that thing that you're feeling in your heart right now is like, I kind of I think this might be my idol. This might be the thing I'm worried about so much. Your schooling, your you know, your education, all these different your friend group, all these different things that you might be finding idols in. Live open handedly with it. Give it to God, and if He takes it away, know that there's something better. If He gets, lets you have it, then yay, yeah, amen. We rejoice in that. And so I kind of have this little chart that uh, you'll see on the screen. That's kind of a breakdown that helps me because uh, I'm a visual person. Basically, it's just kind of a good way to, in your mind, or maybe you can draw it up, to kind of work through these different anxieties and fears that you may come across or have or worries. So first thing is your worry or your actual fear, whatever that thing is, whatever that thing in your heart that you're thinking right now that I don't know if I want to give that up or I, I'm worried about this guy. Like I just really am. First question is, can you control it? And there are some things that we worry about that we can't control. Like we talk about like racism, we talk about injustice, we talk about um, this, these things that are just so big and that we just see and have this visceral reaction to, but just on our own, left to our own devices, we couldn't stop because there are ideas, there are systems in place, there are things that ultimately we can't stop, just one-on-one, -on -one, one person. So then the, if the, question, the answer is no, then we trust God and we give it to him. That's what it leads to. But if it's something that you can't control, what if it's uh, your study habits because you're worried about your schooling and your grades because you're failing or you're worried about um, how much time you spend playing video games, you should be doing other things. If I can't control it, then you have one or two options. You can either accept that thing um, as is, like sometimes there are just certain limitations that you just have. And it's okay. It's okay to have those limitations because once again, your validation does not come from that thing. If you try your hardest and study hard, <clears throat> study hard and all that you get are Bs and sometimes maybe high Cs, but you're giving it your all, then we just gotta accept that and just know that the Lord is gonna take care of where you go to school. And the Lord's going to um, do what's best for you and what's gonna glorify him too. But if it's something that's like, well, I can do something about it um, and I just haven't been trying hard, then work to change it. Uh, if it's like, I don't like looking a certain way, I don't like uh, feeling a certain way, then, then just take the steps to change it. And, all, and in both these options, you still have to do your diligence of being responsible and of doing working hard and work hard to change it. But even in the end, if you pick one of those two options, it still goes back down to trust God with it and give it to him. So in all that we do, no matter if you can't control it, if you, if you uh, can't control it, if you want to fix it or if you don't want to fix it, that we have to give it to God and we have to trust him with it. And just remember, God loves you enough to die for you and your value isn't in him. Like I've said that multiple times because I really want y'all to get that because we as people, especially you guys as young adults, or not young adults, as teenagers, really weigh with that. You worry with like where your value comes from. And I want to let you know it doesn't come from things, it comes from God. Um, and then just the great heart check that Jesus lands a plane with is, for where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So maybe you're going through this and you're like, I don't know. I don't know what my thing is. I think I'm fine. Ask yourself, where's that one thing that if God wanted to take away from you, you would fight and you would hold it a little bit, a little tightly. That's the thing. And it can be something good. Like it's, it's understandable to worry about your family and your siblings and you know what's gonna happen to them. It's understandable because you love them and there's a sign of care that, that comes with 
this feeling of, I don't want something to happen to them or to this thing or that thing, but ultimately we have to trust that they're also in God's hands. And so in that, we live open-handedly with these things and we understand that God has a plan and that it might always go the way we want it to be. It might be painful at times and it might push you further than you thought you could be pushed. But ultimately, God has a plan through it and we just have to see it through and be, and be faithful enough to trust him with that. So I kind of want to land the plane with this one quote that I came across that can really just sum it up better than I could. Um, it's by a guy named Richard Baxter, who's dead now. Uh, he's been dead for a few centuries now. Uh, he has a poem called, Lord, It Belongs Not In My Care. It's a lot of these and thou, so I'm just going to kind of skip to the end part because that's really where he drives the message home. This is kind of what I want to leave you with. Um, and this is what he says. My knowledge of that life, this life, is small. The eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all and I shall be with him. Despite all that we come across in life, uh, losing family members, losing loved ones, friends, all these different things, all the pains in life and all the worrying that we have about the way our countries ran and this, that, and the other, and how we're gonna make friends. It's enough to know that Christ knows what what the plan is and we can just trust him and so i encourage you if that is you right now and you're saying like i just gotta help me help me with my unbelief because i want to trust you i want to give this thing to you help me with it he will um, so i'm going to pray and then we're going to move on to your discussion aspect of this um, and we're going to be good lord god we just we just thank you uh, that you have a plan um, not only do you have a plan but that the plan is good and so in that we can trust that you have a pathway for us and that uh, we don't worry about what we're gonna wear, about what we're gonna eat, about where we're gonna be, where we're gonna go to college, how our grades look up, because we trust that if we are doing um, our side of this and being responsible, that you are going to ultimately work it out for your good. God, I pray for those who are just in their hearts right now, contending and struggling and saying that they just have this gap of of unbelief, of I just don't know if I can get there, that you'll help them to get there. Um, and that in all that we do, and all that we say, and how we move on and move through this holiday season, God, that we trust you and we trust your plan, um, that you have the world, that you have us in your hands, and that's the best place that we can be. So we love you, God, and we just thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.